listen to this music. If you're here for class, uh, please get a name tag and put that on. Grace is Jesus, my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness, and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only. so much wisdom. Lord, we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds that we might grasp some of the things that Lewis is trying to teach us about your kingdom from your word. We pray that you would send your Holy Spirit on our time tonight. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, we are going to make a little bit of progress tonight. I told you last week I was apologizing that we spent three weeks in chapter one, uh, but we, we are trying to pick up the pace a little bit. Some of our audiovisual stuff is a little funky tonight, so just be prepared. I'm hoping that it keeps working, so we'll just see how that goes. So let's start with saying our verse together. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, 
but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. All right, we'll see if that lasts. So we'll start with look carefully. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So for those of you who are new, uh, welcome to this class. For those of you that are new online, welcome. And just a quick word about how to approach this class. You can be on the beach, which means you just show up when you feel like it, either in person or online. You don't do any work. You get whatever you may get through osmosis. And that is great if that's what you want to do. Glad to have you. Or you can snorkel, which means you pay attention in the parts that you like and find interesting, but not so much on the others. Or you can scuba dive. And if you scuba dive, that means that you can take advantage of all of the different resources that are in the emails, the long handouts, like uh, there's another long one tonight, uh, but so good. Uh, but if you're scuba diving, uh, please get that one, but otherwise you might wanna just leave it alone. Uh, if you are uh, joining us online, please do send me an email, Google St. Philip's Church, Charleston, South Carolina, and send me an email and I will get you added to our list. So reading that hideous strength, I know lots of people in this class are in different places in the book. I want to strongly encourage you to read one chapter at a time. It is fine if you want to read ahead. Um, that is all good. We are going to be on chapter three this week and next week, and maybe a little more, but we'll see. Um, I also want to encourage you to make a chart of characters. Next week, my PowerPoint list of characters is going to change and we're going to group them by families. So we will have all the people that are in the company of St. Anne on the Hill, all the people that are at the NICE, and then the people that are Bracton College, and that may help you keep them grouped. There are a lot of characters in here, and so it gets a little confusing. Uh, but I also wanna encourage you to be looking for where themes show up from the abolition of man, because they are all over this book. So just a little bit of review. Remember in the abolition of man, we talked in the first chapter about the importance of objective value and the poison of subjectivism. We secondly talked about natural law, the law of human nature and how important that is. And then Lewis in that last chapter talks about how all this talk about man's control of nature is really a means for some men to use nature as the instrument to control others. And then we talked a little bit about the plot of the other books leading up to this, Out of the Silent Planet. How many of y'all have read Out of the Silent Planet? There's no shame if you haven't, no shame at all. Um, I commend that one to you. It's really, it's a fun book. But in that book, uh, the Cambridge professor, uh, Dr. Ransom is kidnapped and taken to Mars to be a human sacrifice. He manages to escape, befriends the Martians and le learns all about this cosmic, drama that's playing out in the solar system. Paralandra, Lewis's name for Venus, is a retelling of the story of Adam and Eve as if the fall never happened. It is beautiful. I think it has some of Lewis's most gorgeous creative writing in it. And then that hideous strength takes a little bit of everything, academia, university politics, a little bit of King Arthur and spiritual warfare and uh, it is a wild ride. So that is the ride that we're on. In the frontispiece, there's this little excerpt from a medieval poem called And Dialogue. And the little excerpt that Lewis chose, the shadow of that hideous strength, sex mile and more it is of length. And that is about the Tower of Babel. 
and what happens when men try to say we don't need God and we can take things into our own hands and build a better world. Not that we might see some of that happening today. And then Lewis says, this is a tall story about devilry, although it has behind it a serious point, which I tried to make in my abolition of man. And we've talked before about this is really significant because it was very unfashionable in academic circles to say anything about the devil. And for Lewis as an Oxford professor to talk about this as devilry and evil spirits in the world is really quite shocking. So cast of characters, we talked about Jane Studdock um, and her dreams, Francois Alcasson, the criminal that she saw beheaded by someone twisting his head off. Um, and then she was shocked to see that on the front page of the newspaper the next day. Uh, Merlin, uh, the uh, early Christian slash pagan uh, wizard, we'll hear more about him. Mark Studdock, Jane's husband, uh, who has been at Bracton College and is desperate to be part of the inner circle of the progressive element. Um, Subwarden Curry, one of the officials at the college, um, James Busby, another official at the college, Canon Jewell, the retired clergyman, who's one of the few people um, who still has a grasp on truth in the college, Lord Feverstone, who was a villain back in Out of the Silent Planet, but he's made a lot of money and contributed to the right causes and managed to get himself uh, uh, created a lord uh, by the British government. Uh, he has a major role in the NICE, the National Institute for Coordinated Experiments. <laughs> Arthur Deniston is a professor, the Dembles professor and his wife who uh, helped teach Jane Studdock. Grace Ironwood is the first person we've met so far in the company of St. Anne's on the Hill. She is someone uh, to whom Jane was sent to interpret her dreams, someone who has spiritual wisdom. We haven't learned a lot about her yet, but she's going to be a fascinating character. Ivy Maggs is uh, Jane and Mark Studdock's char, as they call it, their housekeeper. Uh, Jane Studdock hates Lord Feverstone because when he came to pick Mark up at their house, he made the unpardonable error of coming into the house and thinking of the housekeeper was Jane Studdock and introduced himself to the housekeeper and congratulated her on her husband, Mark. Meanwhile, while Jane is standing there and Lord Feverstone thinks that she is the housekeeper. Jane is a snob and she is humiliated by this. More about that later. Uh, a new character this week, John Wither. What a nice word, wither. Yeah, he's a bad guy. Uh, he is the deputy director of the NICE. Uh, he has these long conversations where he goes on and on and you think, what in the world is he saying? Uh, very hard to pin down. He never looks at you. He's always looking off into the distance. William Hingist, also known as Bill the Blizzard, uh, who is one of the uh, eminent scientist at Bracton College who's been hired by the NICE, but he is a real scientist as the uh, academics at Bracton and the progressive element say, he's the wrong kind of scientist. He's a scientist that believes in truth, and believes in God, and he tells Mark that he needs to get out of the NICE. And then there's Professor Filostrato, who is an Italian physiologist who works for the NICE and takes an interest in Mark. Now do you see why you need to make a chart? Yes, <laughs> there are lots of them. So uh, we talked in chapter one about Jane Studdock and her dreams, these dreams that she doesn't want to have where she sees things in vivid detail, and then she sees them in the newspaper or other ways and learns that the things she dreamed about actually come to pass and it completely unnerves her. She is not a spiritually oriented person and she is very uncomfortable because she cannot control this. Mark, her husband, is desperate to get ahead in the college. He is willing to sell his soul to anybody that will help him get ahead. 
Uh, we learned about the proposal to sell Bragdon Wood, this beautiful ancient area that people come from all over England to see that's at the heart of the college and they're deciding to sell it off to the Knights. And in the center of that is Merlin's Well. And then the Dembles, these uh, people that Jane knew when she was in college, um, who she regards very warmly. Mrs. Dumble is called Mother Dumble. Uh, and Jane talks to them about her dreams. And then Professor Dumble, who is an expert on uh, the Arthur stories in Merlin, starts talking about how somebody woke up from that period and started talking. We would think they were speaking Spanish. Well, in Jane's dream, she saw somebody woke up, waking up that she thought was speaking Spanish. And so she's horrified by that. So then chapter two, Mark manages to get invited to dinner with the college uh, leadership. This is a big, big deal for a young uh, aspiring academic. He is the only one out of all of these 20 young professors or would-be professors who gets invited to this dinner. So he's very full of himself. He thinks he has arrived and they're recognizing his quality. Of course, he should be invited. He deserves it. Uh, and then he's in there with Lord Feverstone. And as soon as the college officials leave, Feverstone starts talking about how stupid they are and how they're just tools that he's using to accomplish. Uh, and that Mark is so much smarter because he, he understands what it's all about. Well, of course, Mark has no idea what he's talking about, but he's so embarrassed and afraid of losing face that he just nods and says, oh, yes, and uh, just goes right along with it. So you can see he's setting himself up for a fall. So at the end of that dinner, um, Jane is waiting at home, and she's had this horrible night of these dreams and visions. And when Mark comes home, she has kind of a breakdown and sobs on his shoulder. And then the next day, she's horrified that she has done that because she believes herself to be a modern woman that never is vulnerable, who is as strong as any man. And so she is furious with Mark uh, when they get up the next morning. And then when Feverstone comes in and thinks she's the housekeeper, that just about seals the deal. So um, then the story in that chapter ends with Mark leaving with Lord Feverstone to go to Belberry, the headquarters of the Nice and Jane going on a train to St. Anne's on the Hill. And I think I told you last week, there's some wonderful stuff there that we're going to unpack. So that's coming in just a minute. So chapter three, Bellberry and St. Anne's on the Hill. This is just a uh, quick bird's eye view with the bird flying fast of what's going on there. So Feverstone and Mark get to the headquarters of the Nice and Mark is immediately taken in to meet Wither uh, the deputy director of the NICE, and he is the exemplar of doublespeak. If you haven't read that yet, it's paragraph after paragraph after paragraph of all of these words that flow together, but you read it, you think, what? It doesn't make any sense at all. And poor Mark thinks he's having a job interview. And all he's trying to do is figure out whether he's been offered the job or not. And he keeps trying to ask that question. And meanwhile, Weather just ignores the questions and goes on and on and on about how great Mark is, except it's clear from some little comments he makes that he has no idea who Mark is. He doesn't know what his field is. He doesn't know what his background is. He doesn't know where he came from, but he just keeps going on and on about how great he is. And so Mark is getting more and more agitated and Weather keeps saying, oh, you don't have anything to worry about. And Mark continues to try to ask whether, whether he has a job and if he does have a job, what it is, because no one has ever said any of that to him. And then all of a sudden, the interview abruptly ends and Feverstone walks Mark out of Weather's office and Mark has no idea what just happened to him. He doesn't know if he got fired before he got hired. He doesn't know if he got the job. If he did get the job, he doesn't know what the job is. So he is in major, major confusion. So he tries to ask Feverstone, who's been sitting there through the whole thing and presumably knows what's going on. But 
Feverstone, as soon as they go out of the room, he ditches Mark and runs off with some other people to talk and leaves Mark completely by himself. So Mark is standing there in the midst of this institute with all of these people running around talking and just standing there not knowing what to do, not knowing anyone and feeling extremely conspicuous and stupid. But he does eventually figure out that people that are coming in and out of the doors are apparently going into the dining hall and he's starting to get hungry. So he's trying to get up his nerve to go in there because he's afraid he's gonna go in and they're gonna say, who are you? And what are you doing here? And then he's gonna be thrown out and his whole inner circle, inner ring thing is gonna go up in flames. But just as he's being really anxious about that, he sees Professor Hengist, who is, uh, as Lewis tells us in the story, one of the two scientists at Bracton College who has an international reputation. So Mark is very relieved and immediately goes and attaches himself to Hengist, even though he doesn't like Hengist and thinks he's stupid. Uh, so Mark goes over and talks to him and Hengist immediately says that he's leaving the nice and Mark should do so too. So Mark is very confused about that and talks to Hengist and uh, Hengist says, well, Steele and Kasser over here are the people that run sociology. Remember, Mark's a sociologist. So Hengist takes them over to Steele and Kasser and introduces Mark and says, this is your new man. And Steele and Kasser are like, what? We don't have any new man. We don't want any new man. Who are you? Who do you think you are? What are you even doing here? And Mark says, well, you know, Feverstone. And they're like, oh, Feverstone. This is just the kind of thing that happens around here. This is so really intolerable, intolerable that you should be foisted upon us like this. So Mark is feeling extremely awkward in the midst of all of this. And as it starts getting really nasty, all of a sudden, Professor Felistrato shows up. Now, Felistrato is a famous professor. And Mark, one of his highlights of his life was two years before he was seated at the same very long table that Felistrato was sitting at. And Felistrato recognizes him. And so Mark's ego, which has been down in the dumps, vaults back up because this really famous scientist has recognized him while these two other guys who he's supposed to be working for are saying what adult he is. So Philostrato uh, comes up and Mark says, what am, what am I doing? And Philostrato says, stop asking questions. There's no need to ask questions. What the nice is doing is really, really important and all will become apparent, whatever that means. All will become apparent. And he says, the only two people that Mark needs to worry about are whether the deputy director that he just met with, who he couldn't get a straight answer out of, and then this person called Fairy Hardcastle, who is the head of the internal NICE police. And the fairy is a big woman in a black short-skirted uniform. Now, of course, this begs the question of why would a respectable government scientific institution need an internal police force? And why would the head of that police force be the second most powerful person in the entire place. So we leave the action there and it switches back to Jane. And Jane has taken her train up to St. Anne's on the hill uh, to look for Grace Ironwood, the one who can interpret her dreams. So she goes and she meets Miss Ironwood. And when Miss Ironwood comes out, she's dressed exactly as Jane saw her in her dream, same dress, everything which is very unnerving to Jane. And so uh, Grace Ironwood reassures Jane that her dreams are not an indication that she's mentally ill. Jane thinks this all means she needs to be psychoanalyzed and get a therapist. And Grace Ironwood says, no, 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 you actually are a visionary and you see things in dreams either as they're happening or before they happen. And her maiden name, Jane's maiden name is Tudor, and Ironwood explains that several of Jane's ancestors famously had this gift of vision. And one of them actually wrote a book about a battle that took place a hundred miles away from him 
um, that was correct in every particular. So as this unfolds, Jane is getting more and more and more uncomfortable. And then as if she were not uncomfortable enough, Grace Ironwood tells her that she really needs to use these gifts in service to the community at St. Anne's on the Hill because they have her best interest at heart and that there are other people that are interested in Jane's visionary gifts who want to use her powers for subversive purposes and for evil. Well, that is not what she wanted to hear. She just wants all this to go away. So Jane is almost convinced that she should work with these people at St. Anne's, but then all of a sudden, she starts feeling that her pride has not been respected there and her wounded vanity rises up and the fact that she doesn't like mystery and she doesn't like things she can't control and she gets really angry and rebels and said, I want nothing to do with any of this or any of you and walks out. So that is what happens in chapter three. We're not gonna really talk about that tonight because I'm obsessed with this journey at the end of chapter two. Uh, and I hope by the end of tonight, you will be at least a little obsessed with it as well uh, because it is something quite marvelous. So one of the things we've talked about before with Lewis is that there is symbolism everywhere. More symbolism than you can shake a stick at, literally. And every now and then he will use part of the story to tell us a parable. And that is what is going on at the end of chapter two. And you will remember at the end of chapter two is when Lord Feverstone is taking Mark to the nice. And when Jane is taking the train to go to St. Anne's on the hill. So I'm gonna read this, um, just follow along with me. This is the description of this journey in the book. An observer placed at the right altitude above Edgestone that day might have seen far to the south a moving spot on a main road and later to the east, much nearer the silver thread of the wind and much more slowly moving, the smoke of a train. The spot would have been the car which was carrying Mark Studdock toward the blood transfusion office at Belberry, where the nucleus of the nice had taken up its temporary abode. The very size and style of the car had made a favorable impression on Mark the moment he saw it. The upholstery was of such quality that one felt it ought to be good to eat. And what fine male energy, Mark felt sick of women at the moment, revealed itself in the very gestures with which Feverstone settled himself at the wheel and put his elbow on the horn and clasped his pipe firmly between his teeth. The speed of the car, even in the narrow streets of Edgestone, was impressive. And so were the laconic criticisms of Feverstone on other drivers and pedestrians. Once over the level crossing and beyond Jane's old college, St. Elizabeth's, Feverstone began to show what his car could do. Their speed became so great that even on a rather empty road, the inexcusably bad drivers, the manifestly half-witted pedestrians, and men with horses, the hen they actually ran over, and the dogs and hens that Feverstone pronounced damned lucky, seemed to follow one another almost without intermission. The long straight nose and clenched teeth, the hard bony outlines beneath the face, the very way he wore his clothes, all spoke of a big man driving a big car to somewhere where they would find big stuff going on. And he, Mark, was to be in it all. They arrived at Belbury, a florid Edwardian mansion, which had been built for a millionaire who admired Versailles. At the sides, it seemed to have sprouted into a widespread outgrowth of newer cement buildings, which housed the blood transfusion office. So that's one journey. Notice blood transfusion office has been repeated. We'll come back to that. Here's the other journey. The smoke which our imaginary observer might have seen to the east of Edgestow would have indicated the train in which Jane Studdock was progressing slowly toward the village of St. Anne's, a train that sizzled and exuded steam from beneath the footboards and in which most of the passengers seemed to know one another. 
On some days, instead of the third coach, there might be a horse box. And on the platform, there would be hampers containing dead rabbits or live poultry and men in brown bowler hats and gaiters, and perhaps a terrier or a sheepdog that seemed to be used to traveling. And this train, which started at half past one, Jane jerked and rattled along an embankment when she looked down through some bare branches and some branches freckled with red and yellow leaves into Bragdon Wood itself, and thence through the cutting and over the level crossing at Bragdon Camp and along the edge of Brawl Park, the great house just visible at one point, and so to the first stop at Duke's Eaton. Here, as at Willem and Cure Hardy and Four Stones, the train settled back when it stopped with a little jerk and something like a sigh. And then there would be a noise of milk cans rolling and coarse boots treading on the platform. And after that, a pause which seemed to last long, during which the autumn sunlight grew warm on the window pane and smells of wood and field from beyond the tiny station floated in and seemed to claim the railway as parts of the land. Passengers got in and out of her carriage at every stop, apple-faced men and women with elastic side boots and the imitation fruit on their hats and schoolboys. Jane hardly noticed them, for though she was theoretically an extreme Democrat, no social class save her own had yet become a reality to her in any place except the printed page. And in between the stations, things flitted past, so isolated from their context that each seemed to promise some unearthly happiness if one could but have descended from the train at that very moment to seize it. A house backed with a group of haystacks and wide brown fields around it. Two aged horses standing head to tail. A little orchard with washing hanging on a line and a rabbit staring at the train whose two eyes looked like the dots and his ears like the uprights of a double exclamation mark. At quarter past two, Jane came to St. Anne's which was the real terminus of the branch and the end of everything. The air struck her as cold and tonic when she left the station. Although the train had been chugging and wheezing uphill for the latter half of her journey, there was still a climb to be done on foot. For St. Anne's is one of those villages perched on a hilltop, which are commonest in, commoner in Ireland than in England. And the station is the same some way from the village. A winding road between high banks led her up to it. As soon as she had passed the church, she turned left, as she had been instructed, at the Saxon Cross. There were no houses on her left, only a row of beech trees and unfenced plow land, falling steeply away. And beyond that, the timbered Midland Plain, spreading as far as she could see, and blue in the distance. She was on the highest ground in all that region. Presently, she came to a high wall on her right, that seemed to run on for a great way. There was a door in it, and beside the door, an old iron bell pull. A kind of flatness of spirit was on her. She felt sure she'd come on a fool's errand. Nevertheless, she rang. When the jangling noise had ceased, there followed a silence so long, and in that upland place so chilly, that Jane began to wonder whether the house were inhabited. Then just as she was debating whether to ring again or to turn away, she heard the noise of someone's feet approaching briskly on the inside of the wall. So there's some very interesting stuff going on here that we're gonna spend a little bit of time unpacking. So the first thing is to look at some of what Lewis is up to here, because Lewis doesn't do things by accident. He is very deliberate. So the first thing you see here is Mark and Lord Feverstone take off in a high performance sports car uh, and Jane takes the old milk train. And so there's the question of who is in control in each of these situations and where can you go? The second thing is that you see this fast car is heading to what Lewis is foreshadowing as destruction. Everything we've learned about the nice so far should make us have the willies and uh, feel creeped out. So Mark is hurtling toward that destination. And the slow train is heading towards St. Anne's. And of course, the very name of St. Anne's 
is imbued with Christian symbolism. Saint Anne is the mother of the Virgin Mary, and she is the patron saint of mothers. Now you will remember that Jane Studdock was very opposed to motherhood, uh, that she thought that she was an independent and fulfilled career woman, and that children would be an inconvenience and a setback on her road to her personal success party. So um, this is very interesting that it is St. Anne. And then the other thing that you'll notice is the attitude that you see toward the surroundings and the people that they go by on the way. So Feverstone and Mark see the people and the animals and the countryside as obstacles to be endured, animals to be run over without a thought, because they are in the way of what I want when I want it. And on the other hand, we see Jane and this train deliberately slowly going through this beautiful area where not only are the people noticed, but the animals are noticed, the flowers and the trees are noticed, the landscape is noticed, and the beauty of them is commented on over and over. And again, uh, it's so dangerous to read Lewis because you read names and you think this probably means something. So I looked these names up and sure enough, there we are. So the three places the train goes by, Woolham, Curehardy, and Four Stones. Woolham is a famous ancient Saxon family name and the family's motto is, I will defend my God. And then Cure Hardy, the next village, Cure Hardy is if you read Sir Thomas Mallory's Mort d'Arthur, which is the original King Arthur legend uh, written in the French, you will see that King Arthur's son's surname is Cure Hardy. And then as if that's not piling it on thick enough, Four Stones is the site of the first Boy Scout camp in England. And in Lewis's time period, the Boy Scouts were still a Christian organization. And they had famously been outlawed by Hitler as being a subversive group that would stand in the way of the complete control of the state in people's lives. So it's not an accident that that's what the train is going by on this journey. So you see Mark is desperate to get to Belberry and the Nice to find out what his job is, to find out what his future is, to be invited in, to get inside this inner circle, this inner ring where he will finally be somebody. Whereas Jane is desperate to stay out of the company at St. Anne's who are trying to get her to come and inviting her to come, but she does not want to enter in. So there's a lot of contrast going on here. So there are a couple of quotations here that I want us to just take note of. The first one is that big man driving a big car to somewhere where they would find big stuff going on. Um, Lewis is all about pride as the worst of the sins. And you see this uh, in the way that he is portraying Mark in Feverstone. And then this uh, beautiful sentence, the autumn sunlight grew warm on the window pane and smells of wood and field from beyond the tiny station floated in and seemed to claim the railway as parts of the land. And it's the idea that the beauty of God's creation is redemptive, that it can even take something like a railroad and make it into a thing of beauty. Then this next one, each seemed to promise some unearthly happiness if one could but have descended from the train to seize it, a house backed with a group of haystacks and wide brown fields about it, two aged horses standing head to tail, a little orchard with washing hanging on a line and a rabbit staring at the train whose two eyes looked like the dots and his ears like the uprights of a double exclamation mark. And this is that idea of unearthly happiness, spiritual joy that comes from the beauty of creation if we will only allow ourselves to notice it. 
And I did not go down the rabbit hole on this, but I'm pretty convinced that if I were to go back and do a study of English and French landscape painting of the 18th and early 19th century, each of those scenes that Lewis mentions would show up as sort of the bucolic ideal of the countryside. But it's this idea that we are so busy, we are so about our agenda and our pride and everything else, that there's this wonder and beauty that God has profligately scattered all around us, and we just don't even notice. And I think this word sees is not an accident either. Lewis was an authority on uh, medieval poetry. And so Carpe Diem would have been very much in the front of his mind, sees the day, this whole idea of not wasting these moments of beauty, not wasting that moment when the sun is falling just a certain way on the leaves and it's so beautiful. So Lewis is uh, contrasting that with the way that Mark and Feverstone basically just want to run over everything in their cab and they don't notice anything because they're in such a hurry to get to their destination. So then the next one, uh, Jane came to St. Anne's, which was the real terminus of the branch and the end of everything. The air struck her as cold and tonic when she left the station. Well, this is pretty obvious. Lewis is usually at least a little more subtle. Uh, but the terminus and the end of everything, um, that obviously has a double meaning. Um, the end and that it's the stopping point, but it also may mean the end as in the purpose, like the end of man is to uh, worship God and enjoy him forever. So uh, St. Anne's is the culmination of this journey. And remember Lewis and Tolkien are both such huge fans of the vast expanse of the North, Norse mythology and all of that. And so cold bracing air is always a sign of uh, spiritual fervor for Lewis. So we see that um, at this destination of St. Anne's. And then in case we didn't get it, um, well, in case we didn't get it before, he has the rabbit looking like an exclamation mark, okay? I might mean we should pay attention to that. And then in case we didn't get the part about St. Anne's being the end of everything, as soon as she passed the church, hello, she turned left as she had been instructed at the Saxon cross. So Saxon cross is what, what we often call it like a Celtic cross. These are stone crosses um, that very often are at crossroads and often placed near monasteries. So we have this Christian imagery that she's going through on her way to St. Anne's. And then she was on the highest ground in all the region. And she has this beautiful view out over all of the countryside off to where it turns blue in the distance. And of course, there's a whole scriptural idea of holy ground, high ground, holy mountain, all of that. And then presently, she came to a high wall on her right that seemed to run on for a great way. There was a door in it, and beside the door, an old iron bell pole. So the walled garden is one of the great images that was very popular in the medieval period. Uh, it's drawn from Song of Solomon as one of the places and it is um, very much associated with the Virgin Mary um, and motherhood and the beauty of women, the beauty of creation, um, the Garden of Eden, all of that is all wrapped up in that. And then, of course, Lewis is obsessed with the imagery of the door. Almost every Lewis story has a door in it somewhere. And you'll remember John 10:7 where Jesus says, I am the door of the sheep. And so uh, almost every Lewis uh, fiction work has a door in it. And uh, he often uses the phrase like going through the door might mean the incalculable. So there's a, there's a whole uh, sense of mystery and wonder about the door. So there is a lot going on in that journey and that's the kind of close reading that um, I would encourage you to do. That's one of the reasons that taking this book slowly is worth doing, because it'd be easy to just miss all that and say, okay, 
He went to the nice, she went to sing the ends, what happens next? But the, the meat of this book is in these kinds of symbols that Lewis is placing before us. So there are a couple of themes in the first section of chapter three that we're going to unpack more next week, but I wanna just highlight them a little bit. Uh, so in case you go back and reread that chapter, you'll be aware. So the first one is that doublespeak is everywhere at the nights. Doublespeak is that deliberately obscure way of telling, uh, using language so nobody can tell what you're talking about. And the interesting thing is in this story, it is always a characteristic of evil and evildoers. And we live in a culture where there is doublespeak everywhere. We don't use the word doublespeak, we call it spin now, the way you spin a story. But Lewis, when he says doublespeak, that's exactly what he means, shading the truth, leaving in some things, leaving out others, creating false impressions. Uh, which at, in Lewis's day you could do with words. Now we can do that with Photoshop and video editing and all of that in a way that's even more powerful. And that that is a tool that is evil. The second thing that is interesting that Lewis is showing us as a theme is ceaseless dog eat dog competition, flattery and strife. These are rife at the nights. Nice. Every person is determined to get ahead of everybody else, to put down anyone else that's in their way, to insult people. Um, it's just very interesting because particularly if you've read the screw tape letters, that is very much the description of the way hell is, that everybody is about seeking their own advantage and um, stepping on other people in order to get what they want with no compunction about it at all. And you see that in the nice as we get further into the story. There, nobody feels even any remote twinge of guilt about any of that kind of behavior. Um, the other thing that is interesting to note here is that Lewis just matter-of-factly gives extraordinary spiritual gifts to James Studdock and makes very clear that he sees that as real. Um, but he also gives us a subtext that if you have powerful gifts, you must be very careful in using them and realize that the powers of darkness desire to corrupt those gifts. And then lastly, pride and a strong need for control can cause us to miss the will of God. Pride and a strong need for control can cause us to miss the will of God. And this is a thing that's going to get built on in subsequent chapters, but it is something that I think is such an important message for our age, because we, uh, we've talked before about Lewis's idea about chronological snobbery, the idea that each age thinks that we are so much smarter and so much more accomplished than any of those poor benighted people that lived in the past. And therefore we can disregard anything that might have been considered wisdom in a prior age, because we're better than that. We have computers and television. They didn't have any of that. And so obviously, we must be smarter and better than they were. And that sort of attitude carries over into thinking that we know what's best for us. And we don't, we're like Jane, we don't want to submit we don't want to submit to God or his plan. We don't want to submit to his word or the wisdom of others. We want to do our own thing the way that we want to, when we want to. So in case that depresses you, on to practices of hope and wisdom. So let's say this verse from Philippians together. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. And you're going to see the truth of that verse as we learn more about the company at St. Anne's, you're going to see how they practice some of that. So a couple of suggested practices here. First, embrace real pleasures 
that focus your heart and mind on beauty, truth, and goodness. This means things other than watching TV, for example. Uh, embrace real pleasures that focus your heart and mind on beauty, truth, and goodness. And there's this great passage from Psalm 16. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there's fullness of joy. In your right hand, your pleasures forevermore. And then James 1, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shadow due to change. And then uh, that great verse from Isaiah, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. And part of the reason that this is so important is that our culture wants to tell us that pleasures are the domain of Satan that the things that are fun are the things that are uh, part of the kingdom of darkness and that it's boring to follow God. And the fact of the matter is that, that God, uh, and Screwtape has a lot to say about this, God is the author of every single pleasure that there is. And the beauty that's out there, the joy of a good meal, um, the joy of seeing a beautiful sunset, um, the joy of the beauty of animals and things that grow and the sound of birds and all of that. God made all of that. And we need to pray that the eyes of our hearts and our little physical eyes are opened to behold and participate in that. And the second one is related to that. Be alert to your environment and the unseen spiritual forces at work around you. Uh, be alert and of sober mind your enemy. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And the reason this is important is that a lot of times we feel like that we are just in neutral territory, that we are um, not under attack, and the fact of the matter is that Jesus tells us that Satan is the one who is in charge of the earth. And that although there are many instances of God's creation where his beauty and presence still shine, Satan is alive and well and at work. And we need to be alert to that and we need to pray for protection against that. <laughs> Thirdly, seek to discern when the presence of the Lord is surrounding you in your physical environment and live into that realization. It's a great verse from Exodus 3. Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And then from Jacob's dream, and Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. There are times when you can be in a physical place and be very aware of the presence of the Lord and very aware of the presence of the Holy Spirit. And this is a concept that you see, particularly in Celtic, the Celtic Christianity tradition, um, what in that tradition is called thin places, places where you sense God's presence with you in a particular way. And we need to lean into that. When you have that kind of experience, we need to pray into it and ask to be aware of God with us. That may be when you are in church. It may be when you are outside. It, it could really be anywhere. But a lot of times we just think of that as an emotion, oh, I'm happy, when in fact it's the presence of the Holy Spirit that we need to lean into and rejoice in. Fourthly, be alert to whom God is placing in your path. I told a little story about this in the service tonight, uh, but this is such an important thing because we're told to follow Jesus, to follow Jesus's example. And if you look at the way that Jesus lived his life, he spent his entire life ministering to the people that God put in his path. He really was not usually trying to go to see a particular person every occasion. But most of the time, it's just whoever comes into his path. So 
a couple of things here. Devote yourself to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. One of the things that we forget is that God sent Jesus into the world to bring together a people who are called by his name. And those people are the ones to whom Jesus confided his mission to share that gospel with the rest of the world. There is not a plan B. Um, there's not some other group out there that's going to come take the field and do the work um, that we failed to do. And part of what has happened in our culture, there's a great book uh, by uh, one of the Plantinga brothers who are great uh, theologians that come out of the Dutch Reformed tradition. And one of these books is called Whatever Happened to Sin. And he has a very strong chapter in there that's called Amusing Ourselves to Death. And he says, imagine if you were, uh, don't really imagine this, but imagine if you were Satan, okay? I don't really want you to be Satan. But uh, imagine if you were Satan, and instead of having to tempt people into spectacular sins to make them fall away from the Christian faith. What if you could just get all of them to be on their screens all the time so that they never did anything? And it's very interesting if you look, if you've read Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, um, it has an element of that with Soma. So it's just, it's interesting, but think about what would happen if all the energy that we put into screen time was put into uh, thinking about who God was putting in our path for ministry. Now, I'm not saying don't ever be on your screen, but one of the things that I think that plan to get hits at is that most of us get immobilized by these things that are um, not what we think of as really evil. You know, it's that whole idea that we misconceive Satan as somebody that's going to try to get us to go to the strip club or a cocaine dealer or something like that, whereas he would much rather just have us spend all of our time amusing ourselves instead. So that brings me to the hymn um, that we listened to at the beginning. And uh, the video that came through without my trying to have it show um, was coming from the Cathedral of St. Andrews in Sydney, Australia, uh, which is a wonderful, vibrant evangelical Anglican church. And this hymn uh, was written in 2018 uh, by some people in one of their mission churches. And I'm just going to ask you to read these words with me because they're such a reminder of how in Jesus we have been given so much that we take for granted. And the purpose of the hymn is to focus on the fact that it's not about us. We live in a very narcissistic culture. And the point of the hymn is that it's not about us, but it's about Christ's presence in us. So I'm going to ask you to read this with me. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness, and freedom my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to his. Oh, how strange and divine, I can sing all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my side the Savior he will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need, his power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley, he will lead. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ in me. No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. 
For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released. I can sing I am free. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, all the glory evermore to him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you have given us all things in Jesus Christ, that you have poured out the riches of heaven through sending your son to love us, to be among us, and to die on the cross for our sins. Lord, we pray that you would help us to frame our understanding of reality with that bedrock knowledge that it is not about us, but it is through Christ and us. Lord, we pray that as we consider the themes in this book, that you would help us to follow Jesus and to live in a way that we hold out that light that cannot be put out to a world that is suffering in darkness. Lord, I thank you for each person here tonight. I pray that wherever they have a point of need in their lives, that you would meet them there and that they would know your grace and your love. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you are uh, sticking around for a minute or two, please try to introduce yourself to someone you haven't met before. Uh, one of the things that is fun is that we have different people sometimes each week, and uh, there's so many great people here that I would love for you to get to know each other a little bit. So thanks for coming. More next week.